have an offering you can bring with this time to the front before she starts teaching. I love our young people. How about you? Yeah. Yeah. about this book. There are so many good things in it. Um, before I begin to read the scriptures in here, I just kind of want to bring you uh, up to par. The nation of Israel, the northern nation, uh, nation of Israel, the southern nation of Judah have uh, been destroyed. They've been taken into captivity. Okay, thank you. And uh, they've been spread abroad all over Babylon, Persia. They're, um, most of them have been relocated and they're no longer in their homeland that God had given to them. Um, I guess for some, about uh, 70 years, the city of Jerusalem um, was a ghost town. You know, you've seen... Uh, when you, if you ever watch the History Channel, anybody like the History Channel? Just me. You know, you'll see these cities that they've discovered that have been uh, just forgotten in time. Amen. Well, this is how Jerusalem would have been, except for God. When the Jews were uh, deported, let me just say this: when the Babylonians came in and they conquered Israel. And they just kind of dispersed them everywhere. They were all separated. I began to think about that in spiritual terms. Um, there have been times that I felt like Satan has kind of separated and isolated me from everyone. Amen? Amen. And that brought me just to present day time with all the um, uh, masks and the quarantine Everybody has been isolated. Everybody has been separated and contained in different places. And that kind of helps us to understand where the Israelites were at this time. They have been sent off into an unfamiliar land around people that they don't know or the ones that they do know are just maybe their immediate family. If they got, and you know, sometimes when they got conquered lands, you didn't know if you were going to get to be with your family. You might be separated even from your family, which we saw that during this quarantine. People not being able to see their aged parents in nursing homes and things like this. So it kind of gives us a look at our world today. But after uh, 70 years, we see that Ezra came in and some of the people began to come home and they rebuilt the temple. But no matter how many times they tried to rebuild the walls, they were unable to do it because of enemies. And it's said that they began to make, now listen to this, they've been, and can somebody check the air because I'm literally burning up up here. When they were taken into Babylon, there were some of them that just settled down. And they began to make homes for themselves there. And there were the faithful that continued to serve God in the land of Babylonia. But they became at ease doing that. They became comfortable not being in the promised land that God had given them. They became comfortable being in captivity. They became comfortable living in a foreign land. They became comfortable being separated from their nation. And don't we see this happen even, and I'm going to bring it back to this quarantine because it helps us understand. 
People had to start going to church at home and watching it on the TV set. And what has happened is so many of them have become comfortable right. and at home right. serving God from their easy chair or laying on their couch or up in their bed just watching church from home. In our lives, when Satan takes us captive, there are so many times when people stop going to church because they've had their feelings hurt or uh, a church split up, whatever. And instead of pressing through, they get comfortable in whatever state they find themselves in. But we find that you have people like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, three Hebrew boys. You had Esther. They were raised to prominent positions in Babylon and in Persia. Esther was in Persia. She became queen of the nation. So we have some of these Jewish people become very important and are raised to prominent positions. And how unlikely is it for someone who has been taken captive to rise to a place of position and power? But do you realize that God had a plan? And each and every one of these that were raised to a position of power and influence were able to turn around and help their brothers and sisters. Amen? And we'll get a little bit more into that. But when in the days of Ezra, when they went in to uh, rebuild the temple, they were able to lay a spiritual foundation. So there's going to be something to build upon when Nehemiah gets there. And as I was reading the history on this, I kept saying to myself, those that wait upon the Lord. At every step, when it seemed like it's over, but those that wait upon the Lord. Their, their city has been destroyed and raised to the ground, but those that wait upon the Lord. They're taking it into other lands, but those that wait upon the Lord. Then we see those raised to prominent positions, those that wait upon the Lord. And out throughout this story, I just kept looking at the events that were taking place when things seemed hopeless in the natural realm, but those that wait upon the Lord. So the book of Nehemiah that we're going to be studying begins um, about 15 years after Ezra and some of the people have gone back to Jerusalem. But it's been a hundred years since they were taken into captivity. Now let me put that kind of where you can understand it. When I graduated high school, it was our bicentennial year, 200 years since our country had been founded. That's 200 years. Take half of that, that's how long it, you know, when you just say 100 years, that doesn't seem that long. A span of a good man, if he lives a good life. But when you look at it in the concept of, I graduated 200 years after our country was founded, that's, a lot has happened. A lot has changed. The culture has changed. The political scene has changed. Everything has changed. But here we see Nehemiah, and I'm going to go ahead and read these scriptures. We're going to start with um, verses 1 through 3, Kara. And y'all hold on just a second. Let me get a drink. All right, starting at verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Achaliah. It came to pass in the months of Kivlev, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the citadel, that Hananiah, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. 
we find that, uh, and Shushan was the, the capital of Persia. And this is where Nehemiah is uh, seated at, but it says that he was in the citadel. Now that's the fortified palace of the Persians. That lets us know that Nehemiah is an important man in an important position if he is protected and living within the citadel. And as he listens to these men from Judah talking about the homeland, and he sees and hears that they are in such distress, they are in danger constantly from enemies that are coming at them. But here lives Nehemiah in a safe, fortified place. Now what astounds me about Nehemiah in this story is that he doesn't act like the normal person would act. So many people, when they are safe and they are comfortable and they hear about the plight of people somewhere else, it's, oh, bless their hearts. Can you even imagine? Oh, wouldn't that just be awful? My heart just goes out to these people. And maybe over the meal, family meal, someone says, let's pray for these people. And oh, they get their hands and they pray for these poor people. <clears throat> but something happens to Nehemiah. His heart is where God is. God says that Jerusalem is an important place. It's a sacred place. Nehemiah is not happy just being safe. I mean, how many times when you hear about Christians being killed in other countries, do you say, that's it, everybody pack your bags. We headed to wherever. And we're going to go help these people work. That's our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're going to war. Pack up, people. Let's go. We're moving. How many people do that? But this is exactly what Nehemiah is going to do. Amen? He is not just moved with compassion for these people, but he is a leader. He is a mover and a shaker. He's a doer. He's not just God bless them. Amen? He's going to do something. Amen? Psalms 137 and 5, 6 says this. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. I can just imagine Nehemiah maybe remembering this scripture out of Psalms and saying, how can I do less than have the same heart that God had? God feels like that about Jerusalem. And I am a man of God. Then this is how I must feel about Jerusalem. It says that the walls of Jerusalem were broken down and its gates were burned with fire. This is the thing that really jumped out at me. He called the people survivors. Now this... You can look at it as a good term, but after all this time, they're called survivors. They're not just called survivors because they escaped the captivity and the roundup. They're not called survivors because maybe they snuck back into the promised land. It's a hundred years later, and they're still just surviving. This is not what God has for his people and I read in the commentary and it said the bad state of the people and the bad state of the city walls were connected. In the ancient world, a city without a wall was open to plunder from anybody that came by. There was nothing to protect them. There was nothing between them and the enemy. They were open prey. An unwalled city with nothing of value in it. And why do I say that? Because if there was anything of value, it would have already been taken. It would have already been plundered. Amen? So they're living in an unwalled, unprotected place with nothing of value 
in their life. That breaks my heart. Because, you know, I got to thinking even about children today leaving, living in homes. And they are in an unfortified, dangerous place. No hope. They're just surviving from day to day. And I don't know if y'all keep up with all the trafficking that is going on with our children. And being sold as sex slaves. And they're being murdered and killed and tormented and tortured. They're living in an unfortified place where they're just trying to survive from day to day. And the thing that this is, is the bad state of their life is due to the bad state of no protection in their life. Amen? Amen. There are women that are like this, that are living in, and I've even heard that there are men that are abused, that are living in homes that are unsafe, unsafe. and I'm thinking, <laughs> I don't know, that, that boggles my mind. I don't know if they married Cujo of a woman and she just beats up on them or what. I, I don't get that, but, you know, I, I know that it happens. So there are a lot of people that are in unwalled cities. It said those living in these unwalled cities lived in constant stress and tension. They never knew when they were going to be attacked again. They never knew when raiders would have gone come in and kill and rape and plunder the little that they had again. But again, my mindset put those that wait upon the Lord. Amen. 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 But when you're looking at somebody that is being attacked time and time and time again, it's really hard for them to cling and hope, hold on to that hope, right? But isn't that why God set into positions of power, Daniel? Isn't that why yes, Esther was raised to a position of power? Because God had to position someone else into a place of power and able for them to have the influence and the authority to take care of the people who were living in unwalled, unfortified places. Um, he talks about uh, Nehemiah's reaction when he hears about the state of Jerusalem. What did he say? He said, I sat down and wept. He mourned for many days. It also says he was fasting and praying before the Lord. Ne Nehemiah's immediate reaction was not just blessed or hard. It was, uh, he went to extreme measures immediately when he heard the state of his brothers. Um, I got to thinking about the amount of time that he spent praying, fasting, crying, weeping, mourning over this city. And in here it says that it took 52 days for the walls to be built. But that came after much Weeping and praying and mourning and fasting before God. Which lets me know that's where the work is taking place. That's where the victory is being won. Before the victory ever comes, the victory was won already when Nehemiah hit his knees. God was going to use Nehemiah to do something about the situation of Jerusalem. But first, he had to do something in Nehemiah. First, he had to do something with Nehemiah to prepare him for what he was going to do. And I know that it's hard for us to see God move in our situations, but Nehemiah had been put in this place for this time. He was not put into a position of power for himself. He was put into a position of power for someone else. But so many times we get caught up in ourselves, in our positions of power. And we forget the people that God really intended for you to be in that position of power for. Nehemiah didn't do this, thank God. He still had a heart for his people and a heart for God. 
God saw the need from heaven. God heard the cry of the people from heaven. But little was going to be done until God could find a man that was willing to go. Um, Ezekiel 22 and 30 says this. God says, So I, fought, I sought for a man who would make a wall and stand in the gap. This is needed more today than it ever has. I mean, people, you know, they're, they're talking about these vaccine passports, and I, I, I just, I'm thinking, you know, we are marching swiftly toward revelations. We are marching swiftly toward tribulation. But even more, we are marching swiftly toward the rapture. Amen? Amen. I, I'm, I'm ready to get out of this unwalled city and go to a city built with gold. Amen? <laughs> with pearls, with precious jewels. Definitely a fortified city. Red Path said, made this quote. There is no winning without warfare. There is no opportunity without opposition. There is no victory without vigilance. For wherever or whenever the people of God say, let us arise and build, Satan says, let me arise and oppose. Do y'all see that? We're going to have warfare. We're going to have opposition. We're going to have to be vigilant. Amen? But now this last part. Whenever we say as the people of God, let us arise and build, Satan says, let me arise and oppose. Now, I don't know if y'all are as excited about church as I have been getting but service after service, worship has been building in this house. Amen. Service after service, the anointing is beginning to flow again. Service after service, hearts are being pricked. They're being humble before God. Service after service, worship is arising. And the people of our church are saying, let us build. Let us win lost souls. Let us see healings take place. Let us see miracles take place. So what does Satan say? Let me get up and mess things up. Amen? <coughs> and he's been trying. Amen. Let me tell you, he is fighting the good warfare. And I was telling somebody just yesterday, there are so many Sundays, and I hate to admit this, but I'm just going to be real with you. There are so many Sundays that as I'm walking up those steps right there to come up on the platform, I'm taking off my garment of mourning, and I'm grabbing my garment of praise and putting it on. And every Sunday morning we pray, God, let us put everything else aside. And right now, in this moment, we focus on you. We focus on worship. Nothing else matters what happened before or what's going to happen when we leave. But for this moment and this time, we are here to worship you. Yes. Right. Satan is never going to stop fighting. And that's what we constantly have to keep... I do. Maybe you're better at this than me. But I have to constantly remind myself, he's fighting me because I'm fighting for God. Amen. He's trying to tear me down because I'm trying to build up. Amen? Yeah. So anything in your life that you're facing right now, remember, if you're trying to arise up out of your situation, if you're trying to build something, Satan's going to do everything in his power to raise it to the ground. Amen? Um, says in here that leaders must have a big vision. And Nehemiah does. He has a great big vision. And he says, through me, God's going to turn things around. Through me, God's going to build up a wall that hasn't been able to be built up. Through me, God's going to bring salvation to his people, protection back to his people. 
And he says that he was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Um, before we're going to see something happen, there is going to have to be some work we put into it. Amen? Amen. If you want to see growth, then you have to do something about it. If you want to seek deliverance, then you have to do something about it. Yes, God brings the victory. Yes, God brings the finished product. But he works hand in hand with us. There is always something that we must do with God, for God, for something to happen. But here's the problem. Or at least this is how the problem as I see it. And that's laziness and complacency. Amen? For us to have a vital youth group, then somebody has to sacrifice their time to study. Somebody has to sacrifice their time to get up down on their knees and pray. Somebody has to do something. Amen? An on fire youth group doesn't just happen. Yes, God will send the fire, but he's looking for a man that's going to build the wall and stand in the gap. He needs somebody that's willing to do something. But we have a church world that is full of, oh, God bless their souls. Oh, let's pray. What are you going to do? You have to put feet to your prayer. Amen? Faith needs action. Faith without works is? Amen. Works without faith is? Amen. But faith and works work together. Amen? Amen? One without the other is null and void. Let's go ahead and read 5 through 7. I think I skipped 4. Um, and I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now. Day and night for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we, listen to what he's saying, which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. Nehemiah is a godly man, but he's identifying himself with those who have forsaken and forgotten God. He's identifying himself with the sinning in order to bring them back into reconciliation with God. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you have commanded your servant Moses. Prayer is vital and it is essential. It is necessary. It is a prerequisite to leadership. Without prayer, you're never going to be a good leader. And let's, leadership means influence. Amen? Leaders influence other people to do. Now here's the question. Are you going to be a good leader or are you going to be a bad leader? Because a leader influences one way or the other. Just because there are, there are leaders of gangs. Amen? And they influence them to, to kill, to do drugs, to steal, to commit crimes. Amen? So leadership is influence. Now, it's easy to look over a pastor and say, are you a good servant? Are you a good leader or a bad leader? But I want you to back away from the pastor a minute and look in your own mirror. Each and every one of us are a leader in some sphere of our life. If you're a father, you're a leader of your home. If you're a mother, you're a leader of your children. If you're a boss at work, you're leading that company. Somewhere in your life, you have influence over other people. Are you a good leader or are you a bad leader? Nehemiah, we find out, is a very good leader. The only way to accomplish anything spiritually is to cover it in prayer. And for four months, 
Nehemiah prays. For four months, Nehemiah fasts before God. For four months, he mourns for the state of Israel and weeps bitterly over the state of Israel. Nehemiah is doing spiritual work. Nehemiah is covering what he's going to do for God in prayer before he ever moves. Anybody in here prone to move before you think it through? <clears throat> I think we're all guilty of that sometimes. We react to a situation without first stopping to think. We jump in to do something that we think is good. We jump in with all four without asking God if this is his plan and his design. Just because anything that we do, whether it's for God, whether it's for our family, whether it's for our company, whatever we do needs to be bathed in prayer. Now, unless, unless I'm wrong, and I pray that I am. I don't think that happens a lot. I don't think that people stop and pray over everything that they do to make sure that what, at what, whatever venture they're headed into, make sure that it's of God. Make sure they're doing it God's will. And like I said, it doesn't have to be always about spiritual matters. It's about everything in our life. Why? Because everything in our life is connected to the spiritual part of us. So whatever we do in the physical realm, it's going to affect the spiritual realm. So it's not just praying about matters about church. It's not just praying about spiritual matters. It's praying about everything because everything affects the spiritual. Um... I wrote down here at the bottom, so don't just sit and wait, pray and see God. <laughs> because I've been saying, those that wait on the Lord. But in your waiting, it doesn't mean grab a bowl of ice cream and sit there, well, I'm waiting. <laughs> see what God has to say. We wait in prayer. We wait and seek God. Waiting means being still until you hear the voice of God. Am I right? Waiting just doesn't mean pulling the covers over your head and going to sleep until you, God shakes you awake and says, okay, I've got a plan, let's go. Amen? All right. He tells God to let his ear be attentive and his eyes open. When we humbly serve God, we understand that our complete dependence is upon God. And he, he specifically states the God of heaven. Not just any God. Because there are so many today that say all paths lead you to God. You know, all religions are relevant. Um, relevant. I said relevant. Irrelevant. Um, but Nehemiah prays to the God of heaven. Because this is the only true God. This is the God he has been raised up oh, living for. I wrote this. God will allow you to be fruitless to expose your need for total dependence. And that was just kind of a wow statement to me. Because we expect God to bring fruit into our life. You know, um, I poked hole in the ground and put a seed in it. Now God, give me a crop. Now I know that we sing that song little as much when God is in it, you know. And that's true. But God wants us to realize that our total dependence is upon Him. Now, Pastor can testify to the fact that building or planting a garden is not always productive, right? <laughs> there, have, there have been times that we've had great gardens overflowing. And then there have been times that we've gone out there and go, 
Where, where's it at? <laughs> I know I planted something here, but I'm not seeing anything. And in our lives, we can begin to feel like that. You know, I've, I've prayed over my kids. I've helped them up to God. I brought them to church. I taught them the word of God at home. I, you know, we have, we feel like we've been um, good husbandmen over our, um, our garden. But a lot of times we do it in our own efforts. And by much doing, you know, if a whole there are little fannies to church every Sunday, Sunday night, Wednesday night, youth camps, you know, then I'm doing good. But God wants you to understand that whatever garden you lead, whatever garden you have influence over, unless, unless you're praying to God for that garden, unless you acknowledge that God, unless you water it from heaven, it won't grow. Unless your sun shines on it, it's not going to grow. Unless I get out there and pull the weeds out of it, it's not going to grow. Unless I nurture these plants, they're not going to grow. And we, we have to realize that it is God that brings the increase. The Word of God tells us men can plant and they can water, but it's God that brings the increase. And when I read that God will allow you to be fruitless, God will allow you to sit there and reap nothing if you're not being dependent on Him. He will pull everything back until you stop and realize what is going on. God, I need you. And God goes, oh, there we are. Ha, huh. you finally get it. Amen? Um, there's another quote from Red Path that says this. You never lighten the load unless first you have felt the pressure in your own soul. You are never used of God to bring blessing until God has opened your eyes and made you see things as they are. You can't effectively pray for someone until you've been in their shoes. You can pray with compassion, but you can't pray with understanding. And there is something different when you have walked that path, when you've walked in those shoes, there is a different praying that takes place. It's a praying with understanding. It's not just a praying with compassion for the need, but it's a praying knowing what they're going through, what they're feeling, what they're struggling with, what, what's coming up against them. You know because you've been there. Nehemiah in 8 through 10, let's read this. Where are we at? Remember, I pray, the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But, if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the farthest part of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now these are your servants, this is Nehemiah talking to God. Now these are your servants, and they're your people, whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. And let me go ahead and read this last verse. Oh Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to hear your name. And let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of of this man, for I was the king's cup bearer. He tells God, remember. I think one of the greatest ways that we can pray is to pray God's word. When we pray saying, God, do you remember your promise over here? Do you remember telling us that if we did this, you would do this. God, I'm standing on your word. Amen. You're a faithful and true God. You're a God that cannot lie. If your word says it, then you have to do it, God. And when, you know, the Bible tells, Jesus told his disciples, he prayed, pray this way, thy will be done. How do we pray his will? Pray his word. Yes. There's no doubt 
There's, there's no reservation in my heart and mind that when I stand on his word in prayer, that I'm praying his will. And when I pray his will, it shall be done. This is one of the greatest ways to pray, and that's to pray of the promise of God. Um, let's talk about this ending just a minute. In verse 10, God says to his people, Psalms 81 and 10, he says to his people, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. God will not open his storehouses until we open our mouths in asking him to perform his promise. You can't put food in a closed mouth. And immediately, I, in my mind, I saw a nest full of baby birds. And the mom leaves the nest, and those babies know that mom's going to find a worm. And you can, those little babies can be just as quiet, trust me, I've had quite a few nests in my garage and on my back deck. They can be just as quiet. I can walk out that door, and those little mouths are just open, seeking and searching for mama coming back with some food. But now if mama came back with food and those little birds had their little mouths closed, she couldn't put anything in those little mouths, right? But they are earnestly seeking and searching and their little hearts are open <laughs> and their mouths are open wide to receive. God cannot feed you food, spiritual food. God cannot give anything to you with a heart closed, with a mind closed, with a life closed toward God. So let's open wide our mouths tonight and receive from God. And I have two quotes I want to read and then we're going to close. Again, Redpath said this, Recognition of need must be followed by earnest, persistent waiting upon God until the overwhelming sense of need becomes a specific burden in my soul for one particular piece of work which God would have me do. We can be so scattered and looking everywhere, ever, everywhere around us. What should I be doing? What should I be doing? But he says, when we have that overwhelming sense of need and it becomes a specific burden. Because there's a lot of times we know we have need but we really don't know exactly what it is we need. But when God places that specific burden in your heart that he wants you to do. And again it comes back to what are you willing to do? And Spurgeon said this. Laying the matter to heart he did not begin to speak with other people about what they would do. Talking about Nehemiah, when he finds out the distress that the city of Jerusalem and the, the survivors that are there, he did not begin to speak with other people about what they would do, nor did he draw up a wonderful scheme about what might be done if so many thousand people joined in the enterprise. But it occurred to him that he would do something himself. My God, awaken in us the need not to point the finger, oh, they would be good at this, they would be good at that. But what can I do? Amen. And I love that. It occurred to him, let it occur to us. I'm going to do something myself. Anyone can complain and criticize. And I have been a member of a church. I have served in leadership in a church. And now I'm pastoring a church. Anybody can complain and criticize and through the years I have heard my quota of complainers and criticizers. But I have discovered and found one important thing. Most of the time, the ones that are complaining, the ones that are criticizing, are the ones that are doing nothing. If you can do it better, 
If you're grumping and complaining about what someone's doing in the church, if you can do it better, get up off the seat and do it. If, if you don't like the way we sing, if you don't like the way we play, then learn to sing and play and get up here and do it yourself. I will be more than happy to stand right over there and worship my God. Amen. Just to soak it up. If you want somebody to teach your kids, don't gripe and complain because nobody's doing it. Get up and do it. Amen. Let us not complain and criticize. Let us be doers. Stand to your feet. Father, I love you tonight. And I'm so grateful for your word. I'm so grateful for the history within your word that we can read. And we can see the consequences of bad actions. And we can see the consequences of good actions. Father, I ask, Lord, that you would impress upon each and every one of us that we have an area of influence in our life. Lord, let us be good leaders and not bad leaders. Lord, let us influence for you. Lord, teach us, Father, how to do what is right, how to do your will. And Lord, let us glean from these scriptures as we study in the book of Nehemiah. Father, show us what we need to know in these scriptures. And I give you all thanks and praise in the name of Jesus. And the church says, Amen. You are dismissed. Amen.